Welcome to the Build Business Acumen Podcast, where we deliver practical knowledge and powerful guidance. Here is your futuristic host, Nathaniel Schooler. So today I'm interviewing Sherry Hinnish, and she is an expert in supply chain. Well, it's good to see you, Sherry. Hi, how are you? Very well, very well. I'm a bit cold, you know. It's not too not too bright here in uh, the, well the Tower of London today, but you know there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joining you from sunny Columbia, Maryland. Woo-hoo! Cool, cool. Well, you're you're uh, you're actually known as the supply chain queen, so we're going to talk about that. I'm quite excited about that. I think you've done a great job um, of positioning yourself in the right places, and you've just been accepted. Uh, to have a scholarship at Harvard and I'd just like to congratulate you on that I think that's fantastic thank you well done I'm a first generation uh college student and the first woman on my dad's side to actually attend uh graduate school so this is my second master's and I am beyond thrilled to be uh part of the Harvard community and it's just been an amazing experience it's fantastic well done well done so we're here to talk about supply chain right and i've got a few questions here so how is the supply chain changing yeah so some things are still the same like meeting expectations the voice of the customer creating value reducing risk and costs and assuring supply and execution but what i think is changing is how we connect how and what we promise to customers, to our trading partners, and really how it's executed across these traditional processes of plan, make, source, and deliver. And supply chains around the world are being transformed and modernized. How? And this is more a customer-centric approach. We hear about it, it's on Twitter, it's on LinkedIn, but the way that demand is being fulfilled and how we define value is changing. And this is oftentimes the story behind the number or KPI. So value can mean efficient ways of working, building strong relationships and sustainable business models that are ethically responsible to society and our planet. So it's really all of those things. And then here comes technology and disruptive tech, which I'm sure you know all about. So you com- you're combining these traditional competitive pressures and then technology. So you know sooner, you have to act faster, all in a smarter and agile environment. As he sips his coffee. Well, tea, <laughs> tea. in England, we have tea. Oh, you know I'm, that. I'm <laughs> Do you know what's really funny? Seriously, over here, right? I remember, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just over 40, right? And I remember back in the day, we didn't even have coffee. Like, coffee was never a thing, yeah? It was never a thing, yeah? And then it just be like overnight, Costa Coffee came along, Starbucks, and everyone was like, hey, you want to have a coffee? It's like, but hold on, we're in England. We drink tea. (laughs) (laughs) Right? So anyhow, I digress, right? But so look at the number, look at the number of Starbucks that are being opened in China. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, it's it's yeah, I'm I'm not surprised, you know. It is quite mad, really, how a trend can sort of take over the world, you know. But supply chain is a really exciting space, yeah. Like, I've been doing a bit of studying around tech and stuff, and I love the fact that, you know, as a, as a business, you can kind of predict things a lot better than you could before. So, you know, you can, you can predict that perhaps that, you know, the weather is going to be cold and you're going to need to, to do more of a certain jumper or you know as an example a sweatshirt or you know if the weather's going to be hot for an extended period of time you can you can kind of order more ice cream right i mean like it's just faster and and it and it makes the costs just so much better for the businesses and the wastage as well so exciting but what are the biggest challenges then facing supply chain leaders this is tough Um, And I think I have a point of view and my point of view comes from, you know, my own experiences in leading transformations and consulting some of the biggest companies in the world. 
across strategy, people, process, technology, and change resiliency. So I often hear that agility is the biggest challenge, which is by design, like you just mentioned, being able to sense, measure, navigate, adapt, and communicate to changes in a, a really broad ecosystem. But something that stands out to me is talent management and the importance of people and culture in the management of change. So when you think about all the changes happening in supply chain, the shifts in the workforce, talent, I think is the biggest challenge. And I'm not referring to this, you know, future of work and how robots and automations are gonna result in world domination, duh, duh, duh. But the reality <laughs> that the skills needed in an augmented supply chain enabled with this advanced tech like AI and bringing a, being able to ingest externalities and big data and then forming those causal relationships for prescriptive insights. All of that is going to require an augmented supply chain professional. And I actually, um, according to Gartner, in the next five years, almost half of the supply chain workforce is gonna be comprised of millennials. And the IDC also reports that by 2023, talent shortages in supply chain, are it's going to lead to an overwhelming majority of the top 500 manufacturers in the world to use a digital supply chain AI-enabled assistant. So whether companies choose to embrace a new business model or digitally enable, you really need to think about the capable people that can thrive and lead that sort of change. That's the biggest challenge I believe supply chain leaders are facing right now. Yeah, I'm hearing you. Adaptability is just key. I mean, they already had a robot in uh, Hitachi in 2015. You know about that one, right? In the, yeah. in the, in the, uh, the warehouse, actually it was managing humans and they had an 8% uh, increase in productivity within 24 hours, which was just you know, it's super interesting, but it's like, but it's like, you know, I agree with you. Augmenting it is completely, completely right. Oh, my light just died. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a storm brewing. On the <laughs> hey, I, I will live. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's certainly, it's certainly quite an exciting time right now. And adaptability you know people are going to need to adapt anyway or they're going to lose their jobs so it's like right. well you know it, i i personally think it's actually the responsibility of the companies to upskill people and i think that anyone that doesn't have a continued learning approach to life yeah should immediately just go and walk out right because they're in the wrong they're in the wrong job they're in the wrong place and they need to just do something different you know it's 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 pretty simple really as far as i'm concerned yeah and i i think i think it's uh, my opinion would probably land somewhere in the middle there absolutely i think it's important to have a culture of adaptive learning and continuous learning and that definitely starts top down like the leadership has to incentivize the right behavior but i also think that there's a personal responsibility that you make as a professional to push yourself yeah and to be the best version of yourself that you can be. And I don't know that that is necessarily the responsibility of anyone else, not your spouse, your employer, right. your friend, your family. It really starts with you. And if people understood the power that they have in their personal decision-making every day, the decision to wake up at a certain time, the decision to read for 15 minutes about something they know nothing about, all of those are really small things that don't take any money. You just need to have Wi-Fi and a smartphone, yep. right? Yeah. Um, it's that simple. It's that simple. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Um, I agree on that front. I mean, I think in terms of what I'm actually saying is in terms of kind of if you're in a role, right, and the business knows that you're going to be, in essence, not needed in the next six months year two years they they need to be the catalyst to actually encourage you like you, you know because some people are kind of they kind of just have the wrong mindset like they just need a bit of encouragement yeah and Absolutely. and 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 yeah you know i'm an on i'm an ongoing learner like i have to learn if i don't learn i get depressed yeah if i don't get up at five o'clock in the morning and exercise i get depressed yeah 
So I have to work. I have to exercise. Yeah. And that's me. Right. But like other people, they get depressed if they have to, to work or have to exercise. <laughs> Enter Sherry Heinish. <laughs> but, but, Struggle is real. <laughs> so on to, on to the next question, right? What constitutes a strong innovator? A strong innovator. So I would define a strong innovator as someone who has embraced this concept of disruption by design. And like you said, uh, creates an environment that challenges the status quo, pushes traditional boundaries, and really having the ability to anticipate where trends are heading. So what's the next big thing? What new innovations and improvements might best be suited to help move a business forward? And what I find too is that it isn't just a four walls approach. People think about innovating within their own little company, but you really have to look outside and deploy, you know, system dynamics, system thinking, how are my competitors reacting? What's the voice of the customer? Where's the opportunity in terms of design thinking to really bring in some of those system dynamics and influences and really build that culture of creativity, divergent thinking, having the right people in place versus just checking the box in the hiring process. Yeah. You yeah. have to have diversity and you really have to create the space for risk and free thinking and focusing on people that have the right character and the right passion. And like you mentioned that the opportunity for development, it's not so much, you know, a degree or a certificate, this proxy for knowledge that they, they check the box. They yeah. have to yeah. have the appetite to, Hey, I might not have, you know, a graduate degree in data science, but I'm here, I have the desire and the grit to learn, and I'm ready. Right, exactly. Yeah, I agree 100%. So what are the best ways to improve supplier performance then? Supplier performance, so now we're going outside of our four walls. Um, <laughs> so supplier <laughs> performance, yeah. The sourcing and procurement traditional way of working, it really focuses on assuring supply, reducing costs, and reducing risk. These are the three levers. Okay. Um, however, I think leading companies are looking at things like business continuity, risk management, technology alignment. So this is how we transact and communicate in a digitalized ecosystem around visibility, the financial transacting across procure to pay, and raw material innovation. And I think some folks can really boil the ocean when they ideate about how do we improve supplier performance? We already have great models in place, like Michael Porter, for example, the shared value model. It's simple, it's still true. How do we link competitive advantage to corporate social responsibility? So you can ask very basic questions. Are you meeting the voice of the customer? Does your product or service meet societal needs? How are you optimizing productivity, effectiveness in your supply chain? And this is design, material inputs, leveraging suppliers, you know, having effective production and manufacturing, and most importantly, people. And lastly, how are you improving your local business environment? Are you enhancing areas and communities where you operate? Are you co-innovating with suppliers? And this is process alignment, education, upskilling having a formal plan and conduits of communication in place. So the competitiveness of a company and the health of the communities around it become mutually dependent. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I did a really great interview with, uh, with the CEO of a couple of distilleries and what he's done, he's a complete pioneer in the whiskey industry and him and, him and a consortium of, of, of investors and uh, whiskey enthusiasts they resurrected this distillery in scotland about got to be 20 years ago now i think or 19 years ago they built it up for about 12 years and then they sold it it netted like a hundred million dollars which is the largest ever amount of money for a distillery yeah but they they literally went to the farmers and they said we want you to grow barley and we will pay you a fair rate for that and what was really interesting was is that 
all the other distilleries were basically just using European grains and, and stuff, right? So they brought traceability all the way from the field, all the way through to the bottle, yeah? Which, so you had farmers who were crying, like they were so freaking happy, yeah? Because they hadn't grown barley on their fields for like 20 years or something, yeah? And they were tasting the raw spirit and saying, well, mine tastes more peaty than yours. And that's because my soil is like this. And it was just a fascinating, a fascinating, um, ex well, call it an experiment, you know, really, because you get that in, in wine, but you don't really, you've never really had that before with spirits. So now these guys have actually launched a distillery in Grenada in the Caribbean and also in uh, Ireland and they're doing the same thing. But unfortunately in, our, uh, in Grenada, the Grenadians were very suspicious and, and they said, oh no, we, 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 don't, we don't want to do that. So they were offering them money, like more money than they would get for, for growing anything. They were even going to lend them tractors. They were going to give them everything, yeah, to grow this sugar cane, right? But the guys were like, oh no, you know, I don't want to do it. And so they had to actually turn it on its head and start growing it themselves and actually, and actually you know, decide the kind of sugar cane they wanted, bring the tractors in and, and do it all, you know, turn it on its head really. And very interesting story. It's called, it's called Renegade, uh, Renegade Rum. And oh, wow. I like the name. <laughs> it's, Did it's, they give you a bottle? Uh, oh, I'll, I'm, sure I'll get, I'm sure I'll get a bottle. <laughs> I've still got a cask up in up in up in the old distillery just sitting there. It's like two hundred and sixty liters of whiskey. So That's, yeah, that that'll take you a while. That's <laughs> <laughs> but but they they they've had a real problem recently. They've been trying to move a, a biomass boiler. Yeah. So the biomass boiler came in on a ship. Yeah. And the problem is they put it on a lorry, right? But the thing was too big, and they and they basically have had to drive all the way from the port in Grenada miles and move electricity cables to get this thing through. Oh, just, wow. I'm serious. It's the most amazing story. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'll uh, you should look it up on Twitter. I retweet them every so often because they're lovely people. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what you're what you're teasing out of that story is it's not just about spend when you think about supplier relationship management. You have to think about the capabilities, the speed, the innovation, the footprint. Um, do you see synergies in your product roadmap and is there scalability aligned with with your key suppliers in terms of how you execute your growth plan? Are the cultures aligned? Are you sharing forecasts, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you know, and, and it's most importantly, what I like about your story is, is each party willing to invest and do they have the ability to execute? Yeah. Right. Yeah, completely. It's so simple, though. That's the thing. It is. It's, just, it's so <laughs> it simple. Is. But who's doing it? Who's doing it? Like so few companies are really actually nailing this. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're, they're, and it's and it does. It needs to be top down approach. There's no doubt about it, because. People are just stuck doing the old, same old things. They're doing the same old stuff, you know, and they need to just change, turn it on its head and have a good think about what they're actually doing. Yeah. Right. That's, right. that's, but the problem is we get caught up in the day to day runnings of, of our businesses and our lives. And then we don't have time to think. And that's the real problem. People need that time, I think, to actually go through it, you know, really. Right. When you, when you have this culture of firefighting, it's, it, it takes a completely different mindset to be innovative, really not even be innovative, be creative. Because where the rubber meets the road, that's innovation, but creativity and having this space to just think about new ways of engaging, new ways of working, that takes a devoted space in the day. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. So, like fighting fires, to being a leading innovator in supply chain <laughs> management, any business. It just doesn't happen that way. I totally agree. I totally agree. So did I ask you what, what does an alliance with a key supplier look like? I've kind of got lost with my story, I'm afraid. Uh, no, we, we didn't cover that, but um, I, I, can, I can share a point of view. And I think that, that you know, I am a more progressive supply chain professional. So um, an alliance with a key supplier to me 
really addresses the joint value creation. So this is what we've been talking about, this win-win where in that synergy and that Venn diagram, you have competitive advantage. Right. Uh, of course, reducing risk is a critical objective in any alliance and also corporate social responsibility, the trend and the need to make sure that you have ethical labor, ethical sourcing, ISO compliance, anti-corruption, and just overall sustainable business practices. Like, that's really, really important. Um, the question that I always ask people is, are you tapping into supplier-led innovation? I read somewhere that 89% of companies reported having a major supplier risk event in the past five years. Wow. Have you even considered where you're single, sole sourced, or how you can optimize your network? What are the trade-offs in that? You know, are you doing any simulation in risk response and recovery? Um, and if you want to deliver growth and market advantage, these are the types of things that should be at the top of your list when you're thinking about an alliance. Now, the elephant in the room is that it's often the internal management of change that's a huge hurdle. Meaning, if you want to uncover these opportunities, top-down leadership, you must move away from the short-term focus, the human dilemma of hyperbolic discounting. You have to adopt a more long-term, holistic approach in supplier management. So it, it, it talks about you know, shifting from price, unit price, to total cost of ownership from this three-month you know, target to a three to five year strategic plan to, to, you know, gain value from both sides. And this isn't just suppliers, but also customers, you know, any external trading partner. So I would say that secondary to, to some of the points I mentioned, really make sure that you try and clear out the politics in an organization and the resistance to change so um, you can relate effectively with your internal neighbors, like quality, R&D, and operations. Those are all critical colleagues to, to a supplier organization. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, for sure. You know. So what are the most important considerations for supply chain managers and other key stakeholders? I would, I would say take the time to understand your current state you would be surprised. I've been in really large companies and folks just skip this critical activity. They have no idea what's going on end to end. They don't know about the handoffs to their neighbor. You know, everything's just sort of tossed over the wall. Right. So I think the most important considerations are document your processes across functions and within your ecosystem of trading partners. This is upstream with your suppliers and really downstream in you know, how you're executing, distributing to the end user, or the customer. So um, also understand your organization's capabilities. How are you measuring success? How are you incentivizing the right behaviors? What are the trade-offs? How are those prioritized by segment? And um, I've seen a lot of value left on the table, frankly, because organizations, they just don't spend enough time dialing in good process and developing talent and effective behaviors within their own supply chain. So the most, the most important consideration is communication. Right. Take the time to focus, focus on connecting people and creating this ripe environment for success. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it makes sense to talk to your suppliers because they, because they're already supplying similar businesses to yours. So they're going to know, they're going to know what widget works. They're going to know what this works. And, you know, it's just a no brainer as far as I'm concerned, really. And, and, and it's, it goes back to the mindset. So many people are focused on unit price and productivity. Yeah. They really, they don't understand, wait a minute, what, what am I leaving on the table? I'm so focused on price. Yeah. Just start with, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's so simple, isn't it? But people just miss it. It's like they're like this. Oh, yeah. To oh, it's sorry. totally, it has to, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes, right? Like, it's not rocket science, is it, at the end of the day? But, but, it, but you know, there's, I think the cutthroat style of doing business is just dying out. Like, even as far as, like, the pushiness of selling, like, that's, that's even dying out, you know? And it is more about the partnership kind of arrangement, isn't it? It really is nowadays. You know? It is. 
It is. And if you, and I, I feel like, you know, if you're constantly selling someone something like why? It's oh, not authentic. It's a headache. We had this conversation about brand over sales. Like you, I would always pick brand, always brand hmm. because you know, I feel like if someone, if I, if it feels really sleazy, like oh. pushing a product, you know, I, I, for some reason it's a big turnoff, but I'm a, I'm in a different segment, right? I'm sort of, you know, I'm, I'm new school. Yeah. But I don't like being pushed things. I had a, I had a sales trainer many years ago and he, he used, uh, he wrote a book called the accidental salesman, unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago, but, but this book, basically just describes the whole ethos of just soft selling. It's like, and soft selling is just like, find out what they want, you know, help them to understand more about what you can help them with and then help them to buy. Like there is no closing, like closing doesn't really exist. It's kind of like they close right. themselves because they want to buy. Yeah. It, right. it's, it's, you know, it's totally different kind of thing, but partnership, is even better because you don't even need to close. You say, look, I know what job you're in. I want to make you the most indispensable person in that department. If you work with me, you're going you're gonna to go far. And that's it. It's very simple. Like, that's one of the most important lessons that I've learned. Like, anyone I deal with, I want them to feel better when they've left working with me than before they started. Direct result. That's it, right? It's, it's very simple. It's very simple. Yeah. I, I think I think that we have we have deconstructed everything in business, supply chain, and technology into three points. <laughs> this, this, this podcast. Add value to yourself in continuous learning and curiosity. Add value to others, make them feel better and feel like nothing's impossible, and add value to the world around you, including yeah. your training partners and your suppliers yeah yeah it's, it is. <laughs> three things. it's really important but we've got this final question here that i'm super excited about as well right because this is this i'm right into te i'm a bit geeky when it comes to technology if you could like i just got a new computer and stuff so i'm just like really geeky yeah so what excites you most about the use of technology in the supply chain and why and why? Okay, so I, I, I definitely, I think AI has the potential across many, many domains and applications to completely disrupt traditional supply chain practices and, and ways of working. I actually just read an article that McKinsey published, and it's a great piece that highlights where AI has proved helpful in tackling challenges and risk for the benefit of society. So this could be application and crisis response, human trafficking, you know, adding value and validating information and automating that decision response. So when you think about supply chain execution, sort of this domain that I live in, AI supports natural language processing and structured deep learning across traditional plan, make, source, deliver processes. So it's this marriage of AI and analytics the ability to perform a task that exceeds anything that humans have ever been capable of in terms of scale and accuracy. And when you use this structured deep learning to analyze and derive insights and then cascade that decision making, you know, all the way upstream and then see it through into manufacturing and then to the end customer, it's completely mind blowing that. Right. Moving to prescriptive analytics is powerful because in the past, it's imp it would be superhuman to ingest all of these externalities like weather, local events, you know, changing consumer trends, social media, social listening, social insights, and then parse through all that data to make a recommendation. AI, within seconds. It's oh, yeah. Done. It is, it is exciting. It's very it's exciting. And, and it's pretty darn accurate, too. Oh, it's yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, one of the other things that uh, is really close to my heart, I think, is, and I know there's a lot of hype. So let me just start by saying I know there's a lot of hype around blockchain, but I think the promise of blockchain, um, creating trust and transparency and one source of the truth, 
I, I hope we can get it together, folks. I really do. Yeah. <laughs> because supply chains are evolving and the difference is more around the promise. So what's our promise to the customer? How do they feel it? How do they see it? How do they trust it? And then how are we able to connect across different platforms, different processes, and to different trading partners with one source of the truth? So um, I like the honesty in sustainable decision-making that blockchain can provide, where you can leverage it for real-time visibility, but then also understand provenance and the ethical sourcing of goods. Like you mentioned, yeah. track and trace, saving lives when a product is recalled. Um, being able to trace something back to the lot or the batch or the raw material source, the farmer in Idaho, not to call out Idaho, but um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I don't even think that we have scratched the surface of blockchain's potential. And it really has, it can change the way that we connect and communicate across all boundaries and intermediaries. Oh yeah, I agree. I, I, I think apparently... I, I heard that it will actually reduce the costs, uh, the reduce the wastage of food by 15% globally. That's what I heard. Is that correct? Well, uh, what I can't speak to your source, but it absolutely has the ability to reduce obsolescence, particularly in, in food, the yeah. transport of food and dairy. Yeah. Those, those, those case studies, those use studies have already been published, uh, particularly in India in the dairy market. Yeah, yeah it's 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 so exciting I, I actually i'm really excited about it but i but i think that you know there's a lot of mis, misinformation around ai everyone you know like you get ceos yeah that like go to i've got some friends who are like you know machine learning professors and you know they do iot and you know like all the real stuff right and mm -hmm. like they get approached by ceos and they say i want some ai it's like, well, okay, that's, that's great. You, what do you want it for? They're like, I don't know. I just want some AI, right? And, oh, yeah. and they don't understand the fact that that AI is going gonna, is gonna to need implementing. It's going to take two years from start to finish before they can even implement the Internet of Things and they can plug it in and they can get the right data and the right sensors and this and that. And they don't realize they're going to have to spend more on their staff, yeah, for two years okay to implement this and it's like they just ask for ai it's just like some ridiculous world of hyperbole that they're lost in these people no it's, idea it's, people it's like a menu it's like checking off you know, yeah like, yeah and in 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 ai it's not a rip and replace like you can do you can implement ai really smartly and you know, you're augmenting your decision making and you're you're really leveraging big data and edge technologies like you yeah. mentioned. So you're able to make more effective decisions and you're able to respond more effectively. But I think that a lot of folks, they misunderstand AI is not going to completely re replace the future of work. No. It just doesn't no. work like that. Even, I mean, you can conceivably automate like very tactical things, but humans are going to be here for a long time yeah, yeah that yeah. sort of relationship and some of the softer skills like eq and how you're managing change and none of that goes away even with ai even in the 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 most advanced and progressive companies that i've seen you still need people the future of work is human yeah i totally human. agree but the thing is is that we now we now need to claim the promise that they offered us right when you had so you had the industrial revolution yeah and it and it, i talk about this a lot because i complain about it a lot yeah <laughs> and well it's like in the industrial revolution yeah we were supposed to have better lives yeah and work less right and make more money yeah and we? yes well i think so and 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 the thing is, we're still in the industrial revolution, whether you like it or not. Like people talk about the second machine age, the third machine age and all this. But actually, we're still in the machine age, right? Like that's that's where we are. Yeah. So so for people, they need to work less, make more money, enjoy what they're doing more. Yeah. We need to be more like the French. I hate to say it. They, <laughs> no, no. They work 35 hour weeks. Seriously, yeah. If you give me a 35 hour week, right, I will I will just I would jump up and down. Yeah. 
seriously, right? I would just be like over the moon. Yeah. <laughs> it's why I'm wearing a hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, I don't work 35 hours. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I have a different point of view and we've, we've talked about this before, just this whole idea of work life balance. I, I don't get it because I feel like if I'm not super passionate and engaged and really excited about the work that I'm doing, why am I doing it? Yeah. So there is, that line is very blurred. Like, and even when people say, you know, you should work a 35 hour week, if you're, if you have that guardrail and you have that like ticker in your mind, okay, I'm approaching my 40 hour work week. Maybe you need to rethink what you're doing. Very good point. It's a very good point. Um, because life is so short and I can't imagine I have aging parents right now. I don't know if you hear my parents downstairs. Oh, I didn't hear um, them. No, it's crazy to watch your parents age. And yeah. you know, you think about your own mortality. And I think when I am 90 years old and I look back, I want to be able to say, God, I had a great life. I did everything I wanted to do, you know, and all of the things that happened in the middle, they were kick ass. Yeah, like, yeah. That, that's what I. That's the feeling that I want. So, dear God, please let please let me never think about my work week and limit the hours that I work. <laughs> you know, because then it's just not worth it. Like you, you, know, you, you have to be into what you're doing at yeah. the end of the day. Well, it's about it's about listing the things that you hate doing and getting someone who likes to do those to do them right. That's that's what it is. Like, I don't mind editing episodes or audio files, right? But doing the transcriptions and turning them into really long posts, like ten thousand words, yeah, gives me a headache. Yeah. However, I've found someone at the moment who enjoys doing those. You see, and that's brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> Yeah, that, 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 that can actually be an AI enabled task. Oh, I know. I've uploaded it. I've, I've got the most amazing AI transcription tool. It is amazing. 85 to 90 to 90 percent accurate. Seriously. Awesome. You have to share that with me. Uh, I might I might tell you <laughs> I, I'll, I'll drop you. I'll drop you. Uh, I'll drop you a link to it. No worries. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. That's been fantastic. So if people want to get hold of you, they just look for Supply Chain Queen, right? They just type that in. Yeah, supplychainqueen.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all of Facebook. So, and oh, I am, oh. you know, I definitely love engaging with people and hearing from them. So it's it's been a pleasure. And I, I think you're awesome too. Oh, thank you. That's really nice. I just yeah. work so hard. I love what I do. And that's, and that's kind of what it is, you know? It shows. It shows. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe and wherever you prefer, share with your friends. And if you enjoyed the show, drop us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen.